Okay. Uh, previously, yeah, we've looked at uh, God's redemption, Passover. We've looked at uh, the festival of first fruits. We've looked at uh, Pentecost. We've, uh, last week we covered a large territory. Where we looked at uh, Yom Kippur, uh, the Day of Atonement. And in each of these, God is giving us his prophetic thought. Uh, one of those is Feast of Trumpets. And, you know, it starts out with the Sabbath, where God created. We remember that. And then he made a plan for our salvation, our redemption. That was the Passover. That was Christ that pointed that away. And then we had uh, first fruits, where Christ was the first fruits of the uh, New Covenant. And then we get to Pentecost, that was the giving of a spirit. And then we get the Festival of Trumpets, the uh, uh, Yom Kippur, or uh, the Day of Atonement. And then we had the Festival of Booths. So we listen for the trumpets to be called home when God gathers his people back together. And then we will uh, have real atonement. And then we will celebrate because the festival of Luke represents a celebration in our future home. Is what that represents. Now, so we pretty much hit all those that the Levitical uh, specified feast, but there are a couple of others that we're going to talk about tonight. We're going to talk about Hanukkah, the Feast of Dedication. We're going to talk about Purim. The Feast of Dedications actually mentioned in John, and where Christ is called out, or where he tells them who he is one more time uh, when they're talking about the dedication of the temple. Now, this was actually prophesied by Daniel. I will try to, I'll hit the highlights of history, but I'll, I'll hit some of it. But it was actually prophesied by Daniel. It's also called the Hellenistic period. That's where you'll find that uh, some of the Jews took up the Greek lifestyle. Anti Anti Antiochus Epiphanes is where he claimed to be God. <coughs> Of course, he sacrificed the pig at the altar, desecrated it. Uh, he erected a statue of their God there. And then the coming Antichrist is going to do the exact same thing. Now, we go back to Daniel. And he's the third year of Belshazzar the king. A vision appeared. I was looking. Uh, it was in a citadel of Susa, province of Elam. I lifted my eyes, and behold, a ram had two horns in front of the canal. The horns were long, but one was longer than the other. <coughs> and I saw the ram budding northward, southward. There were no beasts who could stand before him, nor was anyone he would rectitude for his power, but he did as he pleased, and he magnified himself. While in the observing, behold, a male goat was coming from the west over the surface of the whole earth. He's talking about Greece here. Alexander the Great. He came from the ram, had two horns, and uh, of course he destroys everything in front of him, shatters his two horns. The ram had strength, no, and no, no strength to withstand him. He hurled him to the ground, he trampled him, and the male goat magnified himself exceedingly. But as soon as he was mighty, the large horn was broken. In other words, as soon as he finished conquering, Alexander the Great died, and there came up four conspicuous horns toward the four winds of heaven. Now, that's talking about that about 20 years after the death of Alexander the Great, the kingdom will be broken up or divided amongst his four generals. But if you really want a soap opera, go back and read that and see how all that comes about. Because basically, he anointed or he put uh, one wife as queen, 
his mother didn't like it, so she had this one murdered and then that one, and just back and forth. It was a soap opera of how they ended up dividing it among themselves. And out of one of them, a rather small horn, which grew exceedingly toward the south, toward the east, toward the beautiful land. He's talking about toward Israel. It grew up to the host of heaven and caused some of the host of the stars to fall to earth. And it trampled them down and magnified itself equal with the commander of the host. And it removed the regular sacrifice from him. And the place of the sanctuary was thrown down. And on account of the transgressions, the host will be given over to the horn, along with the regular sacrifice. And it will fling truth to the ground and perform its will and prosper. Then I heard a holy one speaking to another holy one, and said particular to the one who was speaking, How long will a vision about the regular sacrifice apply, while the transgression causes horror as to allow? It says, For 2,300 evenings and mornings, then the holy place will be properly restored. You know, the first was the kings of Medo, Medo and Persia, Cyrus, which we'll talk about. Hero. Shaggy Oak was uh, Greece, and uh, those arose, but they didn't have this power. Now, in the antiquities, the Maccabees, the generals of Antiochus' <coughs> army, now this is about 150 years after the uh, kingdom was broken up. Judah, Judah Maccabee assembled the people and told them that. After the many victories which God had given them, they ought to go up to Jerusalem and purify the temple and offer the appointed sacrifices. But when, the, but when he, with the whole multitude, came to Jerusalem and found the temple deserted, its gates burned, the plants growing in the temple of their own accord because of the desolation, he and those with him began to lament at their distress at the sight. So he chose some of the soldiers and gave them an order to fight men that had guarded the upper city until it was purified the temple. <coughs> when therefore he had carefully purged, he brought it, gold of new vessels, the manure, the table, incense made of gold, and built a new altar with new stones that had not been hewn by tools. 25th day of the month, which the Macedonians called, they lighted the lights that were on the menorah and offered incense upon the altar and laid loaves upon the bread and offered whole offerings. As it happened, these things took place on the very same day which, three years before, divine worship had been reduced to an impure and profane form of worship, for the temple had been had remained desolate for three years after he made so by Antiochus. And the desolation of the temple came about in accordance with the prophecy of Daniel, which had been made 480 years before. So Judah and his fellow citizens celebrated the festival of the restoration for eight days, admitted no sort of pleasure, but everyone feasted very rich and splendid sacrifices, and they honored God and delighted themselves with palms of praises and playing of parts. Indeed, they were so very glad at the revival of the custom after so long a time, having unexpectedly regained the right to worship, that they made it a law for their prosperity that they should keep a festival celebrating the restoration of their temple, worship for eight days, and from that day we celebrate this, we call the Festival of Lights, because I imagine our hopes in this rite were brought to life. Now, they also, they call it the miracle of the oil. It took eight days to actually purify the oil and go through the ritual process that was supposed to be burned in the manure. And they only had one day's supply when they started. They put it in, and that one day lasted for the full eight days until they had more oil, got purified, and they could actually uh, be continued forward. Now, we get to the uh, Maccabees here, or the Hasmoneans. You know, we talk, already talked about the death of Alexander the Great. They broke it up. 
and it was sandwiched between two of the rivals, and they fought, fought oh, back and forth over for the next couple, 125 years. And uh, basically, the uh, Antiochus got mad. He tried to uh, force the Greek culture upon the Jews. It also gives us the rise of that Hellenistic period here. Uh, and then he started his abominations. But when the uh, Maccabees took over, they assumed the throne. And they also didn't go after, didn't go find the, uh, Aaron's priests. They just instituted who they wanted as priests. So they became known as the Maccabees. Uh, yeah, uh, of course, Antiochus underestimated the will to shrink. And uh, it was 164 BC that they rose to power. They claimed not only the throne of Judah, but also the post of high priest. And of course, that conflicted with what they were supposed to do. That's what they did. Uh, they ended with King Herod killing the last of the Hasmoneans. Of course, we already talked about it. Because of the, trying to enforce the Greek culture on everybody, um, they accepted, and that's where you get the Hellenistic Jews. Yeah, they removed all desecrated idols from the temple. They removed the altar and placed it outside, awaiting word from a prophet who would tell them what to do with these stones. They built a new altar, got stones that were unhewn, like they're supposed to be. Day day celebration. We talked about. Uh, well, they celebrated the menorah the eight days. The only actual religious obser observance is the lighting of candles. Candelabra, called the menorah, holds nine candles, one for each night, plus a larger one for a servant candle. Hmm. Let me see that again. They eat uh, foods. Uh, cakes. Yeah, another tradition of the holiday is playing a dice game. It's a, uh, what they, here's what they look like. It's got a flat top. Now, it was during the time of Antiochus oppression, those who wanted to study the Torah had to come up with some other way to do it because he banned all that worship. So that's where this dice game came from. It's got Hebrew letters, Nun, Gimel, Hai, and Shin which is a great miracle happened there, referring to the miracle of oil, or the miracle by God. Again, that's what it looks like. Now, also known as a dream. That's right. Thank you for pronouncing that properly. Had a Jewish friend. Now, gift bidding was not part of their traditional celebration. However, it's come into being to kind of uh, placate some of the kids for Christmas. Now we get to the fast forward to John. <coughs> At the time the Feast of Dedication took place in the temple, it was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in the portico of Solomon. The Jews then gathered around him, and they were saying to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answers them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, these testify of me. 
but you do not believe because you are not of my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give eternal life to them, and they will ever they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. The Father and I are one. The Jews picked up stones again to stone him. Now, they're at the Feast of Dedication. They're celebrating the fact that they got the temple back that it was rededicated after Antiochus Epiphanes had desecrated it. And now they hear the words of Jesus saying that basically he is the Messiah. He's the one they're looking for. And they're thinking he's going to desecrate our temple again. That's what they're thinking. Therefore they picked up stones. Jesus answered them. I showed you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you stoning me? The Jews answered him, For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy. And because you, being a man, make yourself out to be God. What did Antiochus Epiphanes do? He made himself out to be God. Jesus answered them, Has it not been written in your law? I said you are God's. If he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father sanctified and sent into the world, you are blaspheming, because I said I am the Son of God? But if I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me. But if I do them, though you do not believe me, believe in the works, so that you may know and understand that the Father is in me, and I am the Father, therefore they were seeking to seize him, and he eluded their grasp. So, Christ has a, we look, if you remember last time, it was at the uh, festival of uh, the booze, where they had the pouring of the water. He said, I'm the water. That's also where they had the lighting of the large candles. And at the end of that, he stood up and said, I am the light. So he keeps telling them at all these feasts who he is. And that each of these feasts point to him. Because he's going to be the temple. He's going to dedicate everything to God. The primary Jewish declaration of faith proclaims that here, O Israel, the Lord our God is one, uh, is one Lord. The multitude that heard him was taken aback. They understood exactly what Jesus meant. At this very moment, Israel was celebrating the deliverance from such a declaration made by Antiochus, the oppressive king and pagan practices he tried to force upon the people. He portrayed that he was a god to them 200 years earlier. Daniel's prophecies declare that another Antichrist will be coming in the future to do the exact same thing. Now, the one weapon that Antiochus really tried to do, he was going to either annihilate or assimilate. And he tried to assimilate them into all the Greek culture. And therefore he wanted everything about the religion about God removed. And so he was trying to assimilate them. So how do we avoid being assimilated into the culture? Christmas, Easter. What other, what other, I mean, cel what other celebrations do we blindly? Uh, what, I mean, there are other things about culture. Mm -hmm. that other than Christmas and Easter, I mean, how do we avoid getting assimilated just into uh, culture? You know, remember the 60s and 70s, you know, if it feels good, do it. Uh, some of y'all aren't quite old enough, but anyway, 
the uh, so how do you avoid being assimilated into current into my, uh, current culture? Renew yourself. Right. Renew yourself. Focus on the Word of God. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you have from God? And you are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God with your body and your spirit, which is God's. But the hour is coming. And now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the fa Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. So, we focus on the Word of God, we'll either know what's right and what's wrong. We won't let society dictate our ethics, our morals, and everything else. Ties right into Pastor Matt's sermon this morning. The so follow the Father. Follow the Father. What I find, I hold an insurance license. And what I find utterly amazing is we have to do these ethics classes periodically. And they have to tell somebody what is right and wrong. And all I can think of is, did your parents never take you to Sunday school? Did you don't know you know nothing? Why not? You know, you gotta, you gotta teach ethics? It's required? Come on. You don't lie, you don't steal, you don't cheat. You don't miss state stuff. You don't, you don't spin, twist the words. Come on, guys. But hey, you got to have ethics. But there's a way to make sure you're grounded. It's called what you got in spirit. Study the word. Awesome. Be no longer conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's correct. See that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception, according to the tradition of man, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. For in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form, and in him you have been made complete. And he is the head over all authority. So what are the elementary principles of the world? Who's, the, who's in charge of the elementary principles of the world? Let me rephrase the question. God. It says don't go that route. It says according to man, according to the elementary principles of the world. Who's the big lie? Satan. Satan. That's right. And so when you look at some of the theories that are out there, and you, you know where they came from. Who causes chaos? Satan. Satan. That's what he's talking about. The elementary principles of the world. But rather according to Christ. You know, he's telling you where to get your information from. <coughs> because the rest of it probably going to have a slant somewhere. Or, if you go with the world's morality, hey, whatever fills you, go for it. So therefore, Hanukkah is a celebration of conception and deliverance, a time to express hope and renew our dedication to serve Him. It is time to throw off the mentality that biblical feasts and celebrations are just Jewish. Scripture revealed that Jesus and his original 12 apostles celebrated the feasts and other biblical holidays. They didn't quit celebrating them just because churches were planted in Gentile nations. History actually reveals that the apostles and their disciples actually taught the Gentiles these celebrations and practiced them together. It wasn't until the Roman church began systematically replacing the Hebrew teaching and practices with non-biblical dates and pagan celebrations that they began disappearing from the lineage of the original churches. So yeah, for about you know, 300 years after the death of Christ, Christians joined 
Jews in, cele in all these celebrations. Okay? And what was the one thing that we saw is going to take place? Which one of these celebrations, trivia question, is going to take place in the millennial reign? Do you recall that one? What we talked about uh, last week, week before. So if you didn't come up, you weren't going to get any rain. Festival of Booths. We talked about. So yeah, we can expect to celebrate some of these later. Just a little trivia. Okay. Questions so far? I'll get us out of time. If I'm going too fast, let me know. Feast of Purim. And that's where God delivers his people. And where do we get this book? What, which book do we get this from? I forget. I'm sorry. Okay. It's actually going to come from Esther. Okay. We'll take this. And Mordecai. And Mordecai. That's right. Now, the. Uh, we already talked about comes from the book of Esther and Mordecai. We're going to also look at some of the other recent events, uh, examples of Purim. It just occurred that one time. Now, Esther call, uh, falls, it says, after Cyrus, he was uh, united the Medes and the Persians. He's since after Nehemiah, after the Jews have been allowed to go back, some chose not to, and those that chose not to, they stayed, uh, and that's where Esther comes from. They had all been released. Now, this is Isaiah, long time before. Thus says the Lord your Redeemer, and the one who formed you of the womb. I, the Lord, am the maker of all things, stretching myself, stretching out from the heavens of myself, and spreading out the earth all alone, causing the om omens of boasters to fail, making fools out of diviners, causing wise men to draw back, and turning their knowledge into foolishness, confirming the word of his servant, and for Forming the purpose of his messengers. It is who says of Jerusalem, she shall be inhabited, and the cities of Judah, they shall be built, and I will raise up her ruins again. It is I, says the depths of the sea, be dried up, and I'll make your rivers dry. It is I who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd, and I will perform all my desires. And he declares of Jerusalem, she will be built. And of the temple, your foundation will be laid. Now, Cyrus is you. No. No, the United States is Persian. So, does, in the Old Testament, does God only work for the Jews? No. No. So he will call anybody willing to be the, his servant that God it will raise up a servant for himself. You know, the Jews, they were chosen. They were supposed to be a nation of priests. That was their, that was their calling. As we are, too. Cool. But God would call Cyrus so at the right time the temple would be rebuilt. He calls him what? My servant. This is a good while before Cyrus was ever even born. Thus says the Lord to Cyrus, his anointed, whom I have taken by the right hand to subdue the nations before him and to loose the loins of kings, to open the doors before him so that the gates will not be shut. I will go before you and make the rough places smooth. I will shatter the doors of bronze, cutting through their iron bars. I will give you treasures of darkness and hidden wealth of secret places so that you may know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who calls you by your name. For the sake of Jacob, my servant, Israel has chosen, my, and Israel, my chosen one. 
and I have also called you by your name. I will give you a title of honor, though you have not known me, for I am the Lord, and there is no other besides me, there is no God. I will gird you, though you have not known me. So, who was this Cyrus? Well, one time, basically, he controlled all the known world at that time. Also known as Cyrus the Great, from 600 to 529 BC, where he lived. He became king after his father's death. He is the father of the Iranian nation. He united the Medes and Persians. There is evidence of Cyrus, if you read all that. Uh, there was a cuneiform, a scroll, basically, a clay uh, scroll that mentions him, talks about all he does. So we know historically, yeah, he did exist, exactly like God said. Yeah. He was apparently benevolent. He restored the local cults by allowing the gods to return to their shrines. Soldiers described the ki king as a conqueror, but as a liberator. Successor to the crown of Mesopotamia. He discovered in Ur. In Ezra, now in the first year of Cyrus, the king of Persia, the order, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, the prophet, uh, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he sent a proclamation through all his kingdom, put in writing, The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kings of the earth, appointed me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Therefore, or what? Whoever there is a is among you of all his people, may find his God be with him. Let him go to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord. And the God of Israel, he is the God who is in Jerusalem. Every survivor, whoever, whatever place he may live, let the men of that place support him with silver and gold, and with goods of cattle, together with a free will offering for the house of the God, which is in Jerusalem. You know, he restored all the holy vessels. Ne uh, Nebuchadnezzar had, take, had raided the temple, taken all that to Babylon. And uh, Cyrus says, hey, send all that stuff back. Now, many of them left. Some chose to stay and not return. Kind of got assimilated. And then, like their life there, decided to stay there. So we get to Esther. <coughs> now it took place in the days of Xerxes. The Xerxes who reigned from India to Ethiopia over 127 provinces. In those days, as King Xerxes sat on his royal throne, which was at the citadel in Susa, in the third year of the reign, he gave a banquet for all the princes, attendants, and etc., the army officers, the nobles, and the provinces. Basically, he breaks, tells his back, she come on out. He goes to this player. She says, nope, ain't happening. So he goes to replace her. And uh, that's when, through a process, Esther gets chosen. Now, there is no, uh, she's not known as a very religious person. In fact, if you research how she gets selected king, she a queen, she'll spend the night with the king. You know, after preparation, he says, hey, you're the one. So there's nothing of, historically that says, you know, she was a very devout Jew. Not like Daniel, who prayed every day. No, she was just faith. Now, she had an uncle. He was pretty devout. His name was Mordecai. Now, he has a uh, guy there that uh, Haman, who doesn't like Mordecai. Now, Haman is uh, 
you know, one of the chief advisors of the king. Now, Mordecai, he has a lineage from Saul. Now, if you recall, back when uh, David had to leave the uh, the temple because his son, or Jerusalem, because his son chased him off, there was a descendant of Saul, Shammai, I believe was one, that was cursing him and throwing rocks at him and everything else. Well, when David comes back to Jerusalem, I say, we're going to kill this guy. And he says, no, let him live. Now, God said, let the guy live. Show mercy. Well, guess what? Mordecai follows that line. That's one of his ancestors right there. So, now this is a few hundred years before we get to Esther. King David is about a thousand, you know, it's about four, five hundred, six hundred years between, because that was a thousand BC, Cyrus reigned from 600 to 529, this is after Cyrus, so we get 500 years later. So, who knows the beginning from the end? Now, there was this, at the Citadel of Susa, a Jew, whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jer, the son of Shema. That's the guy that David let live. The son of Kish, a Benjamin, who had been taken into exile from Jerusalem with the captives. He had been exiled when Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had ex exiled him. You know, it was David's grace through God who said, don't do that. Don't let him live. And we also find another guy called Haman. Now, Haman <coughs> descends from King Agai. He was an Agai. Saul was told to go destroy all of them. But who does he bring back with him as part of the spoil? He brings this king back. He spends at least one night, and then Saul shows up and says, I told you to kill them all. And he grabs the sword and kills him. Guess where Haman originates? From the king. So, not doing what God told Saul to do results in a bad guy. Huh? A bad guy. A bad guy. That's right. Years later. Several hundred years later. You know, after all these events, King Xerxes promoted Haman, the son of the Agag, and advanced him and established his authority over all the princes who were with him. That's the one that he was supposed to kill, and he didn't do it. You know, he came it from Agag. And... Samuel, 1 Samuel, it's written for it. If you want to go look it up, there it is. But that's what comes out of Saul's disobedience. Yeah, of course, Mordecai, he informs the king of a plot against his life, and you can read the whole story there. But then Haman comes up with a plot to uh, get the king to sign off on, hey, we're going to kill, kill all the Jews. And of course, Mordecai tells Esther says, that don't think you're going to escape because once they find out you're a Jew, they're going to kill you too. And so she goes in, she petitions the king, and uh, the king finds favor. And uh, so there's an edict that allows the Jews to rise up and fight back. And therefore, it was. And so through this, God delivered the Jews. So you can look back and say, okay, you got Cyrus, who was definitely not a Jew. You got Esther, who was not an devout Jew, but she did listen and do what she was supposed to do. But it was all through God's plan that had originated back 
from the time of Saul to now. And that's what actually started the celebration of Purim. Now, you probably recall, or not, that, uh, you know, like I said, she wasn't Moses. <clears throat> you know, the book doesn't talk about anything about how great of a person she was, but she wasn't Moses. She was more of a reluctant Gideon. Who, me? Really? Not recorded as being about you. And Mordecai said, Do not imagine that you and the king's palace can escape any more than the rest of them. For if you remain silent, relief and deliverance will come from another place, and you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not attained royalty for such a time as this. So Mordecai understood. So we're going to get delivered. But if you don't come, if you don't do it, God's going to find another way. And maybe you were born just for this one purpose to do that. So, if I start, God can, and He does use those who are willing to do what He tells them to do. Yeah, she's not Paul, Peter, John, Moses, and those other folks. But she did what she was supposed to. And God uses the willing. You know, she faced death either way. If she goes into the king, he's not happy to see her, and he kills her. Or she goes in, he's happy, and he does it. Or if she sits, just stays on the sideline, it wasn't going to turn out good either way. Okay? But God delivered them from that point. Now, that's not the, and they recorded that, and that's what they celebrate is Purim is the date that that occurred. And if you look at their, they said the echoes of Purim in the Nuremberg War Trials, Haman's ten sons were hanged. In 1946, ten of Hitler's top associates were put to death by hanging for their war crimes. An 11th associate, Hermann Goring, committed suicide the night before the execution, which is a parallel to the suicide of Haman's daughter recorded in the Talmud. Now, there were rumors that Goring was a transvestite. Make it even more accurate. And one of them on the way to the gallows said, Purim, 1946. When that occurred, Purim fest. So, it happened then. It happened in 1946. <coughs> Soviet Union. A few years later, 1953, Stalin was planning to deport most of the Jews in the Soviet Union to Siberia. But just before his plans came to fruition, he suffered a stroke and died. He suffered that stroke on the night of March 1st, 1953, the night after Purim. Now, when he died, the plan was not carried out. But his plan was to basically get rid of the Jews. So, 1953. The Gulf War ended on Purim in 1991. Remember all the scuds that he was trying to send over to get, uh, first of all, he was trying to draw Israel in, but he was throwing all the scuds over there. He, they weren't going to get in. He was going to kill them. But it ended on Purim in 1991. Yeah. And on Mo on Monday, March 6, 2023, starts Purim and ends at nightfall Tuesday, March 7, 2023. So oh, that's the next Purim day. Now, God raises people that are going to do His will. 
For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the spirit is life and peace. Because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject it itself to the law of God, nor it is even able to do so. So we have the Holy Spirit that actually guides us. We worship in spirit, not in flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of the fortresses. We're destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. And taking every thought captive to be the obedience of Christ. Therefore, everyone who confesses me before men, I will confess before him, before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. So, do we have a deliverer? Do we know how the, how the story ends? Well, we do. We have a Savior. We have a deliverer. Because he said, I will come and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. With a shout, he says, we will be gathered. We'll be spared the actual judgment of the world. So, what is salvation here? You know, we talked about Sabbath. Relating to God, remembering the creation. For six days, He shall work. The seventh is a day of rest. Which we will actually find when we actually get to the other side. When God redeems the world back. We had God redeeming his people through Passover. Christ dying on the cross, he redeemed us. We have the first fruits. We have a resurrected Messiah. You know, while it's just fables, we know. We had the Feast of Pentecost. Where was the giving of the law or giving of the Spirit? The Feast of Trumpet, where God gathers his elect together. You know, used to call them together, well, it's also going to be used to call us together. We have the Day of Atonement, where we get to make ourselves right with God, the forgiveness of sins. What that was. One day of the year where the high priest would go in and have the scapegoat, and they'd send him out into the wilderness, send them. Take the sins away. We have forgiveness. Festival of Ruth, when God sets us apart on his own. Feast of Dedication. We have a light of this world. And that light is Christ. We also have a piece of truth. And God will deliver his own. We might like the circumstances leading up to it, but we will be delivered. Question. I know tonight was fly through because I could get so I could get to the other side here and get you out on time. But uh So look at this. Do we see God's prophetic clock in action? Yes. Yes, we do. He wants us to relate to God. Relate to himself. He redeemed us for himself. He gives us a Messiah so that we can have. He gave us a new covenant. He gave us the Holy Spirit. At some point, though, He's going to gather us together. And we will have forgiveness of sins, eternal life in heaven. And then we will also have, you know, God's rest. And all these things point to who? It points to Christ. Yeah. The light of the world. And God's delivery. So yeah, is it worth knowing these feasts? 
Yes, yes. it is. Yes. It's worth knowing what happened and how they point to the New Testament and how the New Testament fulfills all those and also points to what's next. On Israel's 70th anniversary, mm -hmm. a return to the homeland, there was a temple coin that was minted, which has a depiction of Donald Trump and King Cyrus stamped on the. It's interesting, I didn't know that. And germs in 2023. That's right. What? It occurs every year, but I just look yeah, at like, it. Yeah, like, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Can you back up one slide for just a second? Sure. This one? Yeah. All right. So, a bunch of all of these species are annual. They get the half all of them happen once a year. That's correct. They do. Mm -hmm. is, it, is it our calendar year or the Jewish calendar year? Well, you can relate the two together, but it's off the it's off the Jewish calendar year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, it's it starts with uh, Passover. Well, that starts with Sabbath, but then the Passover, and then it comes forward. But then we talked about that they have uh, the Day of Atonement, which actually starts their spiritual year. And then they also have a uh, Passover actually starts their calendar year. I mean, it's the 15th day of the first month when they were taken out of Egypt. Mm -hmm. So yeah, sometimes it looks a little funny. Also, they use a lunar year. They use 360, we use 365. Periodically, they will have a leap month to set the calendar back so that you're not celebrating the harvest when you're planting. And so, yeah, you just kind of have to look it up, and but yeah, you can find it. Okay. Yeah. Do I actually believe in what saved always saved? Mm -hmm. It said no one is going to snatch them out of my hand. <clears throat> is this going to be an actual millennial reign? Yes, there yeah. is going to be, because it tells us. It says we're going to celebrate the Festival of Booths there. And beyond that, we don't have to turn a lot. The New Jerusalem, the new, new heavens, the new earth. Okay, questions? Comments? So are we pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, all millennials? I, don't know that. I have no idea. But does 